we, uh, sorry, we mixed it up. Uh, we're going to have uh, the se first talk second. Uh, so Nicholas is going to go second, and Luis is going to go first. So hopefully that's okay with you guys. Yeah, we had to change the computer, and that's a bit of a problem because so I have movies. Yeah, results of a gem. Um, I will report on Diamond. That's the acronym of the project. And um, I have listed the main participants in the project, but I forgot to mention at least 20, 30, 40 others, which participated in one or the other way, which wouldn't fit on the screen anyway. So um, I hope they excuse that. Yeah. Um, at our institute, we have some fun in finding new names. So we have now a project Sapphire, where Diamond is a part of. And um, it, I, I try to point out why we change somehow, at least in the atmospheric department, the politics for the future. Um, MPI is a traditional climate modeling institute. <clears throat> Most people know that. We have been doing that for almost 40 years. And um, we got the feeling that somehow the, there is no fundamental progressing in global climate simulation anymore. So in some sense, um, it's an unsolved solved problem because um, the global models are not really good. And it's extremely hard to change that situation. That's why it's solved, because since 30 years, people tried to make them better, but they didn't really succeed in that. Because the first guess on climate change from the 70s, from a very small group doing it by a rule of thumb in a white paper for the Congress in the US, said, proposed what the climate change will be. And still, CMIP5 gives the same answer. Um, and we think that uh, a way out of this dilemma is going into explicit representation of physics and not the parameterized physics. Oops, sorry. And that means uh, high resolution is the way to go, and we think that we, are, we can find the breakthroughs for the future. So we design a new icon physics package around LES and mesoscale gamma components, which are either available from previous projects or are already used in high resolution regional weather forecasting, um, which runs down to 2.2 kilometer. The LES type of model has been running down to 150 meter, but of course not global. Um, because if you try to change your strategy, you usually tend to say, okay, now let's start. Develop everything what we need, and then we can do a nice run. But when you do that, you spend 10 years, and then you try to run, and you see, oh, I forgot at least 50%. So it's not a good idea. So strategy is start with what we have and decide on further development when we encounter problems. Do it on the fly. For the one who have to do it, it's hard. For the directors who make the decision, it's easy. Anyway, the first step in this is, by taking over what we already have, is that we, at least these three guys there, sit together, had a beer, and decided that it would be a good idea to have an initiative called Diamond. What is Diamond? Um, the basic idea is to create a framework for intercomparison of global high resolution atmospheric circulation models. In the wording of this conference, it's uh, cloud permitting, uh, convection permitting, sorry. Um, resolve the major modes of atmospheric heat transport. That's a very important part. And endeavor to represent the most important scales of the full three dimensional fluid and thermodynamics, because that's what global climate circulation models up to now in the coarse resolution don't really do properly. That includes the ocean, by the way, because that's the biggest reservoir for um, heat. And uh, the initi initial initiative started with four models, but the whole project is open for more. And one of the contributing um, institutions will be NCAR with uh, MPAS. So they started already, as I heard, simulations, but it will take some time till the data arrive in Hamburg. 
Um, the setup is pretty simple. 40 day period with prescribed varying SST and CIs and some support. Um, on, and the idea is to identify similarities and differences um, that emerge at storm resolving scales, so one to five kilometer, as compared to traditional representations of atmospheric circulation as it's done in the coarse global simulation world. And what is then the second part is development further um, frameworks and protocols for improved um, intercomparison projects. And of course, they should be scientifically more ambitious, um, but that will be the hard part. So it's in essence the what lessons learned we from the first project and how to improve things. The current status doesn't look that bad. We have already quite some things. So you can see currently ICON, that's MPI, then FE3, that's GFDL, NICAM, that's JumpStack in Japan, SUM, that's uh, SUNY, and then there's a couple more of ICON experiments <clears throat> and another NICAM. I sorted them with respect to the grid resolution. Um, two runs beside the MPAS ones, from which I know that they're coming, are ongoing. Um, data are partly, well, the stuff which is running in Hamburg, of course, is delivered in Hamburg because it's directly on disk. Um, you see the amount of data. There is a minimal subset of data you have to write. And I know from FE3, they're writing the data in NetCDF. And uh, in the ICON two kilometer run, we write in Crypt2, double compressed. And you can see the difference because it's the same output. Um, despite the fact that people are talking since years about compression of data, they still don't do it. And um, of course, that's getting expensive, like Sam with a 280 terabyte of output for this. That's really massive. Anyway, um, we did some additional experiments with ICON with a fixed climatological SST and CIs and a fixed climatological SST and CIs with convection so that we can start looking into the differences. What is what? Um, okay. All data are available on the Decarset Production Machines file system, spinning disk, so you don't need to wait. If you want to get access, just get an account at Decarset. That's pretty easy. Just write and or you can register online. I think it's not a big deal. But be warned, don't copy all that data. <laughs> Technical challenge, because that's the first things we encountered. It's not that the models cannot do it. That's a very nice thing, what we encountered. Models are fine in doing these things. The problem is, the biggest one was input data, because it showed up that for a global scale, the input data like surface albedo, land use, and all the things, they are not really available in the, in a global sense, available in the needed resolution. And that really can create strange things, like um, land wave emissivity of zero for grid points, which is a nice cause for a model to blow up, and things like that. So that's one thing where we have to work on, because that's not easy to solve. You cannot use uh, an orographic-induced gravity wave track parameterization because the there's no statistics on a one kilometer resolution anymore for the surface, uh, for the orographic height per grid point. And then it's gone, you cannot do it. Anyway, another problem is I don't know of any model who can cope with sealed surfaces because you get surface temperatures of 100 degrees or some Celsius. And I don't know of any model who is really taking that into account. We decide maybe micro scale ones Irrigation is not in the model, as we learned the day before yesterday. It can make a difference of 1.5 Kelvin on the surface temperature. So that's a serious thing. That's only a couple of the problems. Output, as I said, um, we luckily had no problems. It ran asynchronous, so we don't see it at all. And that's pretty good for restart. It takes 25 seconds for the one uh, for the 2.5 kilometer run. So that's uh, no think about. Um, but you need to take care that your models are capable of doing these things. Otherwise, it's no fun. Um, computing aspects, we didn't try to make, no thinking about it, just try to get in the machine and run it. If it takes months, it doesn't matter. Because if you wait for it till you get the computer who can do it in a week, 
um, well, 2050. Um, observations we made during our runs, which makes life li difficult, is that you're usually working on a shared system. Shared system means, in parts, shared resources. And that can really um, hit you, like congestion on network components and things like that. Um, and the other thing is, anyway, no fast HPC production systems are on the horizon. So for the next years, we have to live with what we have. The bigger challenge is post-processing, because people are not used in the climate community to work on such big data. In the horizontal, they have it in long in time, but not horizontally, and that's a big difference. Um, but it's fortunately only an educational problem. So we initiated a hackathon at our institute where people who know how to do these things sit together with the ones who would like to look on the data. And it was very funny because most people rent out with a 100 times or 200 times faster processing workflow than they originally thought it should be, with much less data flow. It's very easy if you know your system, bandwidth per node, total system IO bandwidth, how to remap data in an efficient way. When you have to do data copies, and data movements, that you reduce them as much as possible, that you have a clever organization of your workflow, and that you use capable tools. I added the ones which I know work. <laughs> That's a point. So CDO, Matplotlib from Python, Paraview, Silk, Python, Dusk. I know that NCL is having serious problems with this. So don't touch NCL and try it. Or you can make your last, your last plot when you have reduced your data to something small then it's perfect. But don't use it on the original data. Yeah, and now the fun part, looking into results. Um, Falco showed already a very nice movie. So we have that, of course, unrolled, not on the ball. Unfortunately, what you see is only a high resolution global climate model um, on the upper bound of the CMIP-6 simulations. So that's comparable to T-255, uh, so something like 750 by 375 pixels, because the beamer cannot do more. So we don't see what we see, because it's a 2.5 kilometer run, and it has thousands more pixel, and each pixel there is already, I don't know, 50 by 50 pixel in the original one. So that's nice marketing, and you know YouTube is doing the same thing. You get now before everything you would like to see an ad, and that's only an ad. OK, so for the organizers of the conference, please next time have a 4K beamer. Then at least we can see every third to fourth pixel. Um, OK, that's tr true for almost every institute. Oh, sorry. Yuck. OK, then I let it run. It doesn't take too long. <laughs> no, I try to go forward. Oops. Come on. Ah, oh, I know. Sorry. <sighs> Movies and. OK. Um, during this hackathon, because people didn't know how to work with this data, different groups, small groups, tried to do analysis they wanted to do. And we can see a lot of nice mistakes, what you do when you are in a hurry and you, new, you work with something new and you try to find new tools. Um, these numbers are readable in the original talk. So that's, again, a problem of the um, low resolution. But anyway, what you can see is the OLR in watt per square meter and a comparison to the observations of ICON, SAM, NICAM, and FV3. Um, and the average or the, the global mean of the um, OLR. So what one can see is that all the models are not that much off. So that was one try. Another one was hourly mean precipitation. Um, two satellites, ICON 5 kilometer and FV3 3.2.5 kilometer. There are differences. They are significant. And one has to learn about where it's coming from. But people were already happy having a few on this. Um, because all of these high-resolution models have different grids and very significant different grids, and it's not easy to handle them. So remapping is a serious problem. Um, they made hourly precipitation PDFs for six regions. Oh, 
okay. Um, when you look afterwards in this in this uh, pictures on the web, they look a little bit better. Um, okay, that's the zonal mean precipitation multi-model. So you can already see that um, compared to GPCP, what it means you can look into the only one which from the models which looks slightly different is some. Um, one need to say that GFDL was running a shallow convection scheme, the others not. And what it really means, we don't know yet. Then we compared three ICON runs, one with a varying FS SST, one with a fixed one, and then adding, uh, switching on the convection too. And you can see that the switching on of the convection really changed the picture. That's the dashed line. Um, that's a very nice picture of the problems working with this large data set. So the upper one is the total column integrated cloud water as a diagnostics from the 2.5 kilometer and the five kilometer run. And in the lower part are the pictures of this in a map. What you can see is you cannot see anything. So despite the fact that you have differences up to 10% or 20% in the upper picture per latitude, you cannot see anything of these differences in the maps. So you have to find a new way on how to show that because it's all averaged out by creating the pixels. Um, but, and that's one thing which is more for developers, if you would like to look onto the original grid, um, that's plots of triangles only that would be compared to hexagons in MPAS. And you can see it at the borders of this picture that there is some rough stuff on the outside that's the boundaries of the triangles. That's one time Hong Kong and the other one is parts of the um, tropical Atlantic. And you can zoom into because that's PDF and you can see the single triangles. That's very nice because you can try to hunt problems. That's the um, canaries and the canaries can go up to 2000 meters. That's why you have a wide spread of temperature. Um, you need to, oops, sorry. Because you need to look into new visualization schemes and not this fancy 3D advertising stuff. So that's a really strange view. I don't know if you have seen that before. That's line integral convolution. That's a way of um, showing vector systems. And it's an iterative algorithm and you can tell it, uh, give it a boundary and then you can look for. And the interesting part is where you see this flickering, which is strange, when you do a comparison with CAPE, then you have a high correlation between the flickering and CAPE. That's, for example, one thing. The other thing is you can see divergence region. Um, so that's a very nice thing. And you can encounter um, tropical hurricanes. So like here, and you can see that they have centers, they are more, if you look a long time, you can see them um, going in the direction of Hawaii, so in this area, and there are plenty of, and you can play a lot with parameters in this, and you get, can get re really a lot to see compared to what you're used to. And that's running for 40 days, and we made the same experience as Falco, too many tropical cyclones. And we don't know what, on the, they are in the outside, it's a very nice one. Um, okay. Um, yeah, what is coming in the future? We need to work definitely on input data for sufficient, of sufficient re resolution, and that will be a hard part, especially on land use. Um, we need to work a lot on data vis analysis and visualization because for this high resolution globally, we have no proper way of showing them and always going into a room where you have a lot of screens to put them in the original, that will be difficult. And we intend to, because it's an NWP model and we can use all the NWP setup of it, we can do proper analysis in an NWP way, which is a quite good um, option. Comparison with satellite data, obs uh, with satellite observation data in full spatial and high temporal resolution is one possibility. So you can use Severi from the GOES and Meteor, uh, Metop, um, UMETSAT satellites, and maybe other ones because they are available in the appropriate resolution at least. 
if you take the error bus into account, there's quite some possibilities, but it's hard to do because it's, again, a second source of a lot of data to handle. Yeah, and what we intend to do, because it shows very uh, important, is repeat and initiate more educational and exploratory hackathons for post-processing. Because if you put people alone in a room and let them do something, they make so many mistakes, and they have to work on to get a solution that it takes ages. And if you put them for a lot of hours together with 20 other people, and they go around and ask, you have a, a tremendous speed up in productivity, in exploratory sense. Um, and to show you the real future, that's the, um, a picture of a hurricane in a coupled simulation. It's just put out as we made it, so it's rough, it's not nice colors. The coupling is happening on the ocean time step. And what you can see is, um, what, as a comment to Falco, when um, that's the surface fluxes, and you can see here is the center of the hurricane, and there you have places where you reduce the surface fluxes. That's the depths of the mixed layer in the ocean, and you can see that it's highly correlated to the structure of the hurricane. And if you don't take that into account, you will never ever get a proper tropical cyclone in a model. And there you can see the tropical cyclone in a very nice way. Um, that's the surface temperature. You can see the developed cold pool. And what you can see is if your ocean is a straight temperature layer, as you get it out of an analysis as a driver below, it just moves another way, and everything is not really proper. Or if you're lucky and the structure is given in the observations, then it's OK. But if not, yeah, that's all. <laughs>